Hello and welcome to Off the Fence, a podcast where we deconstruct difficult decision making so we can figure out what's keeping us stuck and more importantly, figure out how we can get unstuck. I'm your host, Karen Covey, a former divorce lawyer, mediator, arbitrator, turned coach, author, and entrepreneur. With me today is Karen McMahon. And in the realm of divorce and relationship coaching, Karen emerges as a true luminary, specializing in the complex arena of high conflict divorce. With unwavering determination and a heart full of empathy, Karen's expertise shines brightest when guiding individuals through the tumultuous storms of high conflict situations. Her signature approach addresses the internal intricacies of intense emotions, fixed mindset, and unconscious behaviors, along with the external complexities of legal approaches, financial awareness, and co-parenting hurdles, ensuring that her clients emerge both victorious and transformed. Karen, I am so excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Karen. What a great introduction. I appreciate that. My pleasure. I mean, it's well-deserved. And I'd like to start with you, as Simon Sinek says, with your why. Why high conflict divorce? Because as we both know, this is one of the toughest areas of divorce to tackle. So why coach people through high conflict divorce? What's your why? Yeah. You know, I started my business as a divorce coach. And over the course of time, I realized that high conflict divorce has so many complexities, both internal and external. And me and my team are so uh, experienced that we decided let's pivot and really support those who are struggling the most. Because those of us in high conflict marriages and divorces tend to also have uh, issues of codependence, people pleasing, and we're the ones who try to control the storm. And so it's like you're on a sailboat and you can grab the sail to go where you want, or you can grab the wind. We're the ones who grab the wind. And so when you're in a high conflict marriage, your high conflict spouse's behavior is so obviously difficult that you don't even look at your own. And so our desire is to really help people keep the focus on themselves, to heal and grow through a process that's just, it's painful. So use the pain as fuel to transform yourself so that when you emerge, you're a better version. You're free and you're a better version of yourself and you can be a better co-parent. That that sounds amazing. And I, I noticed you said, when we are in high conflict marriages, and I happen to know a little of your backstory, would you mind sharing it with the audience so they understand where you're coming from? Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard so many heartbreaking stories over the years, and mine was one of them. I was in a short marriage. Our, we were married maybe 10 years before I started, or even eight years before I started working on our divorce. And so my ex-husband uh, had anger management issues. Uh, the words that were spoken to me were so mean and nasty and hurtful. I couldn't shower hot enough or long enough to, to like get it off. My divorce was three and a half years. Uh, my children were four and six when I told them I am leaving daddy. I took full responsibility because I knew I'd get thrown out of, under the bus. Uh, CPS was involved four times. The police came to the house. There was an order of protection. I was in, I was a fully commissioned salesperson. I was a working mom and I lost all of my business because I was emotionally devastated. I had my one and only panic attack where I thought I was having a heart attack. And I lived in the attic for three and a half years. And it was uh, it was a hellacious journey that was also the most transformative gift of my life. What? I mean, obviously, that's a that sounds like a conflict in terms, hellacious experience and a transformative gift gift. How did you get to the place where you could look at the worst experience of your life and see that it was really a gift? 
Yeah, you know, emerging from it, and and we have a we on our journey beyond divorce podcast, we have a series called Voices of Celebration, which are all of our clients over the years who entered like me, resistant, scared, um, thinking it was the worst thing in the world, and emerged feeling renewed and transformed. And so when I emerged from my divorce in 2006, when I finally left the attic and had my own place, I remember calling my best friend and saying, I am so pleased with the human being I have become that if someone said I had to do it all over again to be where I am today, I would do it on a dime. Wow. That's amazing. You know, I have a business partner, uh, Lisa Brick, and she was raised in a conscious household. So consciousness, intentionality was her life. I was a fairly sleepwalking individual until I slammed into my broken marriage and really began doing the work. That for me, one of the biggest gifts was I went to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon is all about keep the focus on yourself. Like, don't don't clean their side of the street. Don't cross to their side of the street. You focus on you. You do you. And that's one of the foundational tenets of Journey Beyond Divorce. But it was such a gift because it's so easy when the when your spouse is high conflict. It is so easy to be like he this and she that, and like you can you can sing their shortcomings right and their faults until the cows come home. And how many people, and I'll say this and then stop, there is the the divorce rate is higher in second and third marriages because so many people think I've divorced the problem, I'll get on with my life. And then they rinse and repeat. And then they say, why does this keep happening to me? When in fact, they didn't do the work to make sure that they found someone different. So they ended up with the same person in a different body. Yeah, that is so, so true. You and I have both seen it many, many times. And yet it's really hard when you're in a situation that is abusive Mm -hmm. to you to focus on your own side of the street and not on what's being done to you, right? How do you help people change their mindset around it's being done to me versus it's being done for me or I'll work with what's being done to me and make it something different. Yeah. It's, it's not an either or it's a yes. And yes, you're experiencing abuse. Yes. Their behavior is displeasing. It is unacceptable. Yes, yes, yes. And let's look at what you brought to the table because healthy people don't end up in relationships with high conflict individuals unhealthy individuals end up in relationship with high conflict individuals. So the high conflict individual, and this is the the other thing I like to say is like, you know, in today's day and age, everyone's an evil narcissist. And I just, I, I don't, I don't play that game. High conflict individuals have mental health issues and they have, and they have trauma. And so they, there's all types of neurodiversity going on. And so whether you're a narcissist or you have borderline personality, bipolar, OCD, a hundred other things. The human beings in this world who have mental illness are not the evil scourge of the world. They may be displeasing to be in intimate relationship with, and that's where boundaries come in. And what I and what I encourage my clients is when they come to us, they usually feel understandably out of control. Divorce is out of my control. Everything's out of my control. He or she is out of my control. And we get to say, actually, there's something in your control that's a game changer. Would you like to know what it is? And would you like to focus on it? Because you can feel uber empowered going through your divorce if you focus on this thing that's in your control. What is it? It's you. Yeah. And and I think if I'm hearing you correctly, one of the things that is part of you or not part of you um, are boundaries, right? And for people who are in those relationships with a high conflict person, oftentimes boundaries are one of their biggest challenges because, as you mentioned, they're codependent. So if you could share with the audience a little bit about what boundaries are and why they're such a problem in a high conflict relationship. 
Yeah. And, and before I get into that, I do want to say, um, as you're listening to this episode, I want you to put on like a helmet of um, self-compassion and gentle kindness towards yourself. Because even as I say, like, you know, we were, we were, we were wounded coming in, um, whether you resonate with being codependent or a people please or a perfectionist, these are things that, these are coping mechanisms that we created as children in our family. And most families have some dysfunction. Mine, mine was an alcoholic dad and a rageaholic mom and very, very young, right? So like when I think of how young they were, it's like scary that they had three people that they were raising. Um, but but we don't lick it off the grass. We don't make it up. It's not our fault. We learn coping mechanisms to be in these dysfunctional families. And then as we become adults, the very coping mechanisms that protected us, that created our codependence and our people pleasing protected us. We intuitively as children knew how to protect ourselves, those same coping mechanisms are going to lead you into dysfunctional, un unhealthy relationships. We need to shed that armor and create healthy coping mechanisms. And boundaries, I guarantee you, I've yet to meet a client who wasn't good at boundaries, who grew up in a household with boundaries. It's like if you can't play a musical instrument because you didn't grow up with one, that makes sense. If you didn't grow up with boundaries, you're not going to understand what they are, what the value of them are, or how to use the skill of boundaries in a valuable way. So what could you share with our listeners if they think, well, first of all, let's dial this back a little bit and say, let's say you're in a high conflict marriage, a high conflict divorce, a high conflict co-parenting situation, whatever it is, there is a lot of conflict. How do you, how can you identify whether or not you have a boundary issue? How can you identify if you have a boundary issue? Yeah, what if there's somebody Beautiful. listening that says, uh, you know, I don't know if this is me or not. What would you say? How can they figure it out? Right. So so the idea of a boundary is there's there's internal boundaries that aren't often spoken about. And so if you're trying to control your displeasing spouse, you have a boundary issue because you're, you're right there. You've got a boundary issue. If, if you find that um, you need protection from your spouse uh, because of their verbal, physical, emotional, um, financial control, you have a boundary issue. And if you are sitting there and you're going, I have tried, I have told her not to do this. I have told him that I don't like that. And, and they just don't listen. You have a boundary issue, right? And you just don't know you're getting there, but you don't know. And so boundaries are this two-step dance. You set a boundary and you uphold a boundary. So let's talk about the internal boundary first, because I think that this is so fundamental to every relationship we're in, Karen. So how often do you hear someone say, you make me feel? All the time. Well, All I only time. did that because you did that thing. You made me do it. Unless someone has a gun to your head, nobody makes you feel, nobody makes you do. You feel what you feel and you do what you do, but to own that, like that's the first part. And, and I get pushed back all the time. It's like when he said X, Y, and Z to me, he absolutely made me feel unworthy. Well, no, he didn't, because he could say the same X, Y, Z to someone who grew up in a healthy household who has strong self-esteem. And that person would go, wow, that's nasty. Either you're having a bad day or this is the way you behave. But either way, it's unacceptable to me. And they wouldn't feel anything. They wouldn't be devastated or hurt. And so our feelings come from our life history and how we navigated things. And again, that family of origin. And so on a very fundamental level, talk about empowerment. When you can say, nobody makes me feel and nobody makes me do. I have full and complete agency over my emotions and my behavior. We are already in a new neighborhood. We are already in, um, we are building self-confidence, self-esteem, certainty of ourselves. Like that's a beautiful thing. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it makes total sense. But I mean, just putting myself in the position of of the client, right? Not not that I've ever had boundary issues myself, of course. Um, but you know, when you say, but but he did that to me, I you know, or she did that to me, and and it's not right, it's not fair. How come I'm the one who has to change when they're the one with the problem? What right. would you say to that? You don't have to change. You could decide to be just the way you are. It probably won't serve you. And you're not changing him or her. No matter what you do, uh, you're you're not controlling that. So you could do that. You could grab at the wind as long as you're sailing and hope you get from point A to point B. Chances are, if you grab that sail, you're going to be a lot more effective. That is so powerful. I love that. I totally love that. And, you know, I know that the boundary crossing spouse is one type of a high conflict spouse, but there's a lot of different types of high conflict spouses, right? And, you know, if we could just give, give our listeners a couple of examples of different versions of high conflict spouses, because maybe somebody says, well, I don't think that's me, or I'm not sure if that's me, but my spouse does blah, 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 and blah. Yes. And is this a high conflict situation? You know, do I need extra help? Yeah. And the truth is we need boundaries in, in our healthy relationships. I have a 25 and 27 year old. Um, they, neither of them are high conflict. Um, they're 25 and 27. They're gorgeous sometimes and challenging others. But I raise them with boundaries. And, uh, and so actually just was it yesterday, um, my daughter was here and she opened my office door and she needed to know where the tweezer was. And I was on I was on a business call and I just looked at her and I was like, close the door, please. And that's it. That's it. And so learning how to set boundaries is great because it teaches us where where's my limit? That's unacceptable. You know, OK, if you fell and you were bleeding and you needed my help, I might I might stop my business meeting and help you, but not to help you find my tweezer. So, so, so I want to say that boundaries aren't about high conflict, but let's give a couple of examples of situations where a boundary uh, would be valuable. And I do a boundary boot camp. I do a one week boundary boot camp where we talk about those internal boundaries. We talk about yes and saying yes only when you mean it and not saying it when you don't mean it. Oh, that one's big. <laughs> We talk about no, how wishy-washy is your no that you're always getting plowed. Well, I don't really think, but you know, I guess if you really need, but so, and then it's like they blew my boundary down. Well, your boundary was like this ready to blow down. It was like this broken fence, right? Um, and then there's one of the big ones you and I deal with is digital communication. I used to get three page long scathing emails and I would read them. It's like, why are you reading it? Well, well, there might be something important on page two, paragraph three, line six for like four words. So I have to read all of this and, and absorb the abusive, condescending, belittling, demeaning. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take all of that in here all by myself in my protected space. I'm choosing not to have a boundary. There are boundaries for that, really, really healthy boundaries for that. But what would you say to that person who says, look, I'm in the middle of high conflict litigation. What if it, on page two, paragraph three, line six or whatever, there's a couple of words. And then now if I don't read them and I don't know that information, my spouse can go into court and say, oh, but I told her blah, 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 whatever it was. Or I told him whatever it was. Right. What do you say to that person? Well, so so that that is the biggest fear. The fear is the judge, the powers that be, are going to deem you a bad parent because you haven't absorbed all of the abusiveness from your ex. And it's just not true. And so you set the boundary. And all of this is in my boot camp. And it's like, so you communicate what's acceptable. And you communicate that in this particular case, uh, you know, I've noticed there's been a lot of unnecessary criticism in your emails. 
So if you have something to tell me about little Johnny, I suggest you share it without commentary. I did not read your email and I will not read any going forward. Now you have in writing something very specific for the judge to see, but judge, you see, here's four examples of his or her three page nasty emails. Here's my response explaining, I'd love to know their concerns, just um, devoid of the nastiness. And what judge is gonna go, you foolish woman, you foolish man, you have to sit there and read all of that. Like, and when you start thinking that that's the case, that's part of your stuff to work on. That's your challenges to work on. Hmm. And the same thing with texts, the, the, the spouse who, or the ex who blows up your phone all day. I'm, I'm at work. I'm, I'm taking care of the kids. I'm busy. I'm doing things. Why didn't you answer me within 30 seconds? And, and it's like, what would you say though, if the ex, the spouse who's blowing up your phone has the kids, right? And then you're worried that what if he's texting that, or she's texting that little Johnny just fell down and broke his arm and they're going to the ER and you missed it because you don't want to Look at the texts. Because you have an agreement saying, uh, should there be any emergencies, we will call each other or whatever that, whatever the agreement is. So they don't listen to it. So yeah. now you're going to get in trouble from the judge because L little Johnny fell down and ended up in the emergency room and dad who constantly sends, or mom who constantly sends all these nasty texts, um, sent one that was important. Well, and here's the other thing. This actually happened to me. My son fell, broke his arm. I was upstate. I was in a relationship. My ex blew up my phone. I shut it down. And he was like, I can't believe. And I said, you're a parent. You took him to the emergency room. He got his arm casted. What did I need to come home for? What exactly was the emergency that I needed to come home for? I, I called my son. I made sure he was okay afterwards, but it's so interesting. It's like how normal, healthy human beings, if you were married and you were, you were someplace else and your spouse was with the kid when they got hurt and they had to go to the emergency room, you, they'd go to the emergency room. I've been in the emergency room dozens of times with my kids. You take care of it. You go home, you let the other spouse know what's going on. This is a situation where when you're constantly, you, you, when you believe that you have to be at the beck and call of your ex who you've divorced now because of their behavior, that's your choice. And I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to force anyone. It's like, do what you want. But if it's not working for you, there's a better way. Well, let me, let me play devil's advocate for Absolutely. a moment. Let me say, all right, so I'm the the spouse, right? And and my phone's blowing up and I don't trust that my ex or my spouse, whatever he is at the moment, that he will take the kid to the emergency room, that he will do the right thing. I am concerned for the safety of my child. Now, what do you say? So the scenario is the child got hurt. Child got hurt with my ex or my spouse. I don't have confidence in his ability to properly care for the child. Now, what do I do? And the phone's blowing up. So I would say, you know, it's an interesting thing, Karen. The first thing I would do is challenge the my client. Really, so 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 your ex is so bad that your child could need medical care, and they wouldn't get it. And if they say yes, then then we would have another conversation about custody and how true that is, and what their other options are. Because if that's true, if it's true that you feel like your child could literally need, for instance, medical assistance, and be ignored, then we do have, we have a more serious conversation to have. And that's a really important conversation to have. So many of us have to, and so we're kind of going into the co-parenting now. So many of us have to make decisions. I thought my ex could not co-parent because he really didn't parent. I worked full time. I was the main person taking care of the kids. His parents took care of the kids. He was like the last one to take care of the kids. And so I thought, well, you can't get up in the morning. You can't get them to school on time. You can't do homework because you've never done these things. 
he was able to do it all. Did he do it my way? No. Do I think he did it great? Maybe, maybe not. So that's that's one level, but you're talking about something else. And my ex is, you know, he's fairly up there. I never worried that he would like let my kids be hurt. He could abandon them emotionally under his roof. He did that for years. They felt emotionally abandoned. That's something that we coach around and we support people to figure out, well, how are you going to handle this? And how do you support your kid? My kids would call me all the time. I would coach them through what was going on. There were ways that I could help them. I couldn't change the custody. It wasn't bad enough. You're describing something that that's bad enough. If that's what you're dealing with, that then needs to be addressed with their therapist, with perhaps going back and asking your attorney what the possibilities are. So so that one, I think, is, I, I understand you're doing devil's advocate, but I think that's also a really important example of, now that's a red flag that we need to really address. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's important for people to hear these conversations that nothing is black and white, right? Yeah. Everything is somewhere in between and can it's it's how you look at it, how you see it, how you interpret it. The challenge that I see coming from the legal background is that the level of, we'll call it abuse or bad behavior or whatever you want to call it, has to rise to the point of serious endangerment yeah. before many judges are able to do something. So well, if you've got that sort of, you know, like this is going to be, it's going to hurt the kid. I mean, if they don't get their arm casted right away, maybe it needs to be rebroken. I mean, we'll just go with this example, Wh whatever the, the situation is. But, it, and the, the other problem with the court system is something has to happen for bad, ha something bad has to happen first. Right. And then the court can react to it and say, okay, now we will step in. This is not okay. You're not going to be able to do this again to this child. However, when the parent sees this coming and they said, I don't want my child to have to be hurt first, before something can be done. What do you say to that parent? Well, you know, I mean, I had this situation. I really wanted to go back to court and fight for custody. And there was there, there wasn't there was never physical abuse, not with me, not with my kids, but there was pretty severe emotional and verbal abuse. And I remember my therapist and my son's therapist saying, if you get between your kids and their father right now, they're going to defend dad because dad's one of their parents and we all do it. And, and, and then, you know, you're putting yourself, you can't put yourself between them and dad until they ask you to. And so it was one of the hardest things. It was a couple of years. And I remember talking to both of my kids and asking them on numerous occasions, like, if you're struggling that much and you want my support, I'll go back to court, but, and this is the danger. Um, in New York at 14, a child could actually um, uh, be spoken to by the judge or go before the court. And the thing is, how many kids coming from abuse are going to open their mouth and verbalize that their parent is abusive? And so I learned, and I'm not saying my opinion is right here, but I learned that the bigger picture was if I can be the healthiest version of my health self, help my children with boundaries, use every upset, every struggle that they have as an opportunity to teach them emotional intelligence, awareness, boundaries, how to verbalize. There's a saying in 12 step, say what you mean, but don't say it mean. And I would say, I do not care what your father says to you, what he calls you, how despicable or disrespectful he is. And this was my, this was my line. And it still is to my kids. Don't ever let somebody else's bad behavior determine yours. You do not speak to him disrespectfully. You do not behave disrespectfully but you protect yourself. So don't lower yourself to somebody else, somebody else's behavior. And, and so I chose not to go back to court because they were never quite there. And I chose to support them where they were. Um, now there are worse situations where you have to go back to court and you have to fight for custody. And I think that in the realm of boundaries, the court can be a boundary. The court can be something that you use as a tool, but you have to be very careful. You have to make sure 
it's a great time to talk to a coach, right, Karen? Like, is what I think is utterly endangering my kid, really endangering my kid. Let me, let me talk to a therapist, a coach. Let me get a sounding board. Not my, not my loved one, my best friend, my sister, who's going to be like, hell yeah, let's go to court. Not someone who doesn't understand someone who could really help you piece apart. Like, is this endangering the child to a point where it's worth going back to court and supervised visitation, change of visitation, whatever. Well, and, and I would add to that, not only whether it's worth going to court, but what's the outcome of going to court likely to be, right? Yeah. Because what you think may be really seriously endangering your child may be very different from what a judge or a lawyer thinks, right? And it's not even what you think, it's what you can prove. And the challenge is for so many people, the only one who can prove the abuse is the child right. and is the judge going to put the child on the witness stand and is the child if they're on that witness stand even if they're just in chambers with the judge alone with a court reporter is the child really going to speak the truth to the judge that he or she will speak to you or another parent um it's hard i mean people to your point people forget i mean your children are products of both parents for better or for worse, and they want to protect their other parent. And for most of us emerging from high conflict marriages, we didn't have the boldness to stand up to that bully for so long. And now we're going to expect our little person to. And so there are times when you have to go there. And I've, I've supported people in doing that. I would say many, many, many more times people consider the path and coach through it and decide that there's a better way of supporting their kids uh, than putting the kid through that and and maybe it not even going the way that they're hoping for. And then creating, you know, uh, ad additional conflict and challenges. A hundred percent. I mean, the court system by definition lives on conflict, right? It's one person versus another person. That's the way the system is set up. So to think that you're going to use the court system to dial down the conflict yeah. is perhaps unrealistic. You know, and I think that there's uh, another thing, like you don't have to accept inv every invitation to a fight that, that, you know, that you're invited to. And I think that teaching our children that and us deciding that. So another, um, 12 step that I lived by was how important is it? And I'd be like, yeah, it's not that important. Up next, I just, I just, I, I have to decide what are the things that I'm willing to fight with this man on um, for my kid's sake or, or for whatever. And what am I not? And I think that when you've been in a high conflict marriage and a high conflict divorce, one of the the things I really encourage people when the divorce is over, it's like, I want you to consciously take some time to remove your coat of armor, put your sword down, step over the finish line, step into the new chapter of your life, not with the fight, not with the armor, not with the expectation, but let that go. And let's look at what beginning this new chapter of life means because you've been on a battlefield. You do not want to start your post-divorce life all ready for battle. But what would you say to the person who says, but you know, my children are six and eight years old or eight and 10 or however old they are. I can't take off that coat of armor until they're of legal age and they can fight for themselves. I would say that's a tough choice to make. That's a long time to keep on a coat of armor. And if I am prepared for battle, what do they say? If I'm a hammer, everything I look at is a nail. Sure. If I'm prepared for battle, and, and I've seen it a, a, thousands of times, she did, he said, and, and so this gets into what you and I do as coaches. It's like, okay. Uh, what's the fact and what's the fiction? The fiction is this whole story of why and and how it was all planned and how it's purposeful for these reasons. And it's like, actually, he showed up a half hour late. 
he happens to be late as long as you've known him, or he didn't show up at all, or she she said that thing to the kids about you, and she always says things to the kids about you. And so then you get to say, okay, let me sit down with my kids. Tell me what mommy said. How did that make you feel? What questions do you have? How can we talk about this? Let's let's teach our children what a healthy relationship looks like. Let's ask more than we tell, right? Two ears, one mouth. Let's invite them into dialogue. Let's understand what their story in their head is. Let's teach them the difference between fact and fiction. Fact is what happened. Fiction is your opinion, your story, your di inner dialogue about it. Fiction doesn't count. Only the facts count. When we go there and we stay in that safe space and we teach our children that, you will raise emotionally intelligent, boundary badass children who you'll be so proud of the relationships, the intimate relationships, the way that they engage with you, you will have taken all of your pain and suffering and you would have used it to fuel these beautiful human beings in the world. And you will have broken generational chains of all of that abuse by teaching them a better way. Karen, that is amazing. And I can't think of a better way to end the conversation than that. Although I have to tell you, I could talk with you for hours and I think I just might have to have you back. Well, I would love to come back and I love having you on my show as well, Karen. So this has been so helpful and so enlightening. Thank you so much. Where can people find you if they want to follow up with you? Yeah. So Journey Beyond Divorce, we have a podcast that's been out since 2016 with over 300 episodes. So feel free to listen as podcasters. And um, uh, journeybeyonddivorce.com is our website. We have a new free program coming out. Um, it's called uh, Evict Your Difficult Spouse from Your Mind. And it talks about your mental space and how to renovate and renew and redecorate it with your thoughts, your values, your feelings. Anyone going through a high conflict situation could benefit from that. We also have a boundary program and other programs that you can find out about on our website. And I really, I encourage anyone who's watching this or listening to it to check out Journey Beyond Divorce. Karen, you are a wealth of amazing resources. Thank you again for being here. And for those of you who are listening, for those of you who are watching, if you like what you heard, if you like what you see, please do me a big favor, like, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It makes a world of difference. It enables me to continue to bring to you amazing guests like Karen McMahon. So Karen, thank you. And again, I look forward to seeing you all again and speaking with all of you again next time.